Hey everyone, so continuing our discussion, uh, we're going to talk about sampling methods. Okay, so sampling methods is exactly what it sounds like. Okay, it's different ways to collect data. Okay, and how you collect data is very important. Let's say you want to study how much coffee the average person in your city consumes per week. So you go into a coffee shop and you ask people. Guess what? You're in a coffee shop. The people there probably consume more coffee than the average person. That's why they're in a coffee shop. So the numbers you get will be biased towards the higher end, right? You're probably going to get an average which is sufficiently higher than the average of the entire city. Okay? Uh, so these are the kind of things you want to keep in mind. And there's different sampling methods that have their pros and cons. So we're going to discuss five of them. Okay. So first sampling method is random sampling. Okay. So random sampling, exactly what it sounds like, you're randomly selecting people, right? You just go out onto the street, you randomly pick people to walk up to. Okay, you go into some venue, you randomly walk up to people, ask them. Uh, maybe you're not studying people, maybe you're studying something else like cars or buildings. You just randomly select addresses, randomly select cars in a parking lot and observe whatever it is you're observing. Uh, the color, the age of the car, the first letter of the license plate and so on. Okay, uh, so let's say your entire population is represented by this circle and different individuals in the population are different locations in the circle. If you want to look at it uh, visually, you're just randomly picking places in this circle, randomly selecting individuals. Okay. The benefits is that there's no systematic bias that could come into play, right? Because you are selecting these individual units randomly. The drawback is that you might accidentally end up with a bias. For example, uh, in what we have going on here, well, we have a lot more individuals from this location than from this location. Let's say this uh, circle represents the area of a city, okay? Well, we have a lot more people in one neighborhood than in the other. Okay, so there's no specific bias built in, but you might end up with an accidental bias. Now compare that with systematic sampling. Okay, systematic sampling is where you assign a number to every individual in a population. Okay, so let's say here's your people. Okay, and I'm just going to draw circles instead of the whole face from now on. And so on. Okay, and you assign a number to every person. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. And then you select every person whose number is divisible by a certain value. That sounds more complicated than it is. Let's say you pick the value three, you're going to select every third person. Okay, so you're going to ask this person, person three, person six, person nine, person 12, person 15, and person 18. Okay. Let's say the number you select is four, or you're going to ask person four, person eight, person 12, person 16, and so on. All right? So systematic sampling is you're asking every third person or every fourth person or every hundredth person. Maybe your population is, is millions of people, right? You want to do a, a study of an entire country assign a number to every individual in the population and ask every hundredth person or ask every thousandth person. Okay, this is systematic sampling. If we were to look at this visually, 
with our uh, circle here representing an area, right? And every place within the circle represents an individual. You can imagine systematic sampling as something that looks like this. Now, a lot of people will look at that and think, oh, that's random. Well, it's not random, right? The points are evenly spaced out. It's actually not random at all. It's very structured, okay? Uh, so that's the difference between random sampling and systematic sampling, okay? Now, the benefit of systematic sampling, you can't accidentally end up with a bias that favors a particular uh, part of the population. If we look at these two circles here, Okay, and if we're imagining a circle as an area in a city, we have about uh, two or three dots uh, within or bordering each of those circles, right? So things are evenly spaced out among the, uh, the area of, uh, of your population, okay? That's the benefit, but there is a con, okay? Because systematic sampling can lead you to a bias if there is another systematic phenomena affecting your population. And I'll show you what that means with a simple example. Okay. Let's say we have a street. Okay. There's your street. And there's houses along this street. Okay. So there's a house there's a house, there's a house. Now I'm only going to draw a small number of houses. Realistically, if it's a long enough street, you'd have hundreds of, of buildings there. Okay, and let's say over here, on this end of the street, there is an airport. All right, and you want to study the noise level on this street okay now if you do random sampling okay let's say you end up this house this house and these two houses and this house here from your random sampling well guess what you have more houses closer to the airport than farther from the airport if you're studying noise levels along this street you're going to get an average value that is higher than the actual average okay so random sampling will actually could actually possibly give you a, a bias in the upwards direction or alternatively it could give you a bias in the downwards direction systematic sampling wouldn't do that let's say you contact every third house one two three again normally you would have uh more houses but this is just for the the sake of example so systematic sampling the houses are more spread out you don't see as much of a bias towards uh, houses that are closer to the airport right so if you're studying noise level then systematic sampling is a better option than random sampling but let's say you're not studying noise level let's say you want to study how much sunlight is on this street okay and it turns out that there are trees that start with house number two here, and then every third house after. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, and now the street is done. All right. So these locations are going to have more shade, the locations where the trees are, right? Now, if you do random sampling, look at where the red circles are. You have a house under the tree, you have another house under the tree, and you have three houses that are not under the tree, okay? Random sampling gives you a nice distribution where some houses are getting shade, some houses are not getting shade, uh, most of them are not getting shade. It's actually a pretty good representation of how much sunlight versus shade there is on this street. But let's say you do systematic sampling. Okay, because the houses you picked are systematically every third house. And the trees are also systematically at every third house, but shifted over by one. Actually, every house you selected has no shade. 
right? So you're getting a bias. So you're going to get a result suggesting there's more sunlight on this street than there actually is, okay? So for different situations, systematic sampling or random sampling would be better. Now we're going to talk about two other sampling methods, okay? So the next one we'll talk about is called stratified. Okay, so stratified sampling is when you separate your population into groups that you expect to behave differently. And then you make sure that your sample is representative qualitatively in terms of ratio based on those groups. Okay, so the most common form of stratified sampling is male and female. Okay. Very often when statistical studies are done, the people doing the study will try to have half of the sample to be males and half of the sample to be females because they want the sample to be representative of the population and they think that whether someone is male or female will affect response to uh, to their survey. Maybe they're surveying the average height of people in the country, right? They want to make sure that their sample is half male and half female because they expect that the average height for males and the average height for females may be different, right? So if this is what your population looks like, your sample would look something like this, right? So that half your sample is male and half your sample is female, okay? Now, male and female isn't the only uh, categorization that's used for stratified sampling, right? Uh, let's say you th you're looking at something where you think response might depend on age, okay? Maybe it's how different age groups like a particular movie, okay? And maybe in your population, you have people who are 0 to 10 years old, making up, say, 20% of your population. You have people who are 11 to 20, making up another 20%, 21 to 40, make up, say, 60% of your population. No, you know what, not 60, because that would be your whole population. Um, let's go with another 20%. And you have 41 to 60, making up 20%, and 61 plus, also making up 20%. Okay, so there's your entire population, all right? And you want to make sure that whatever sampling uh, you do, 20% of your sample is from the group 0 to 10, 20% of your sample is from 11 to 20 in age, 20% is from 21 to 40, 20% is from 41 to 60, and 20% is uh, 61 or over, okay? Now, these groups, these strata, do not have to be the same size, okay? Maybe you're looking at income level, okay? Maybe you have people making from zero to $30,000 a year are 15% of your population. People making 31 to $80,000 a year make up say 60% of your population and people making $81,000 and more make up 25% of your population, right? That's what your population looks like. So when you select your sample, you want 15% of your sample to be making from zero to $30,000, 60% of your sample to be making from 31 to $80,000, and 25% of your sample 
to be making $81,000 a year or more. Right? So let's say your sample consists of 200 people. Right? You want 30 of them to be making 0 to 30k. You want 120 of them to be making 31 to 80k. And you want 50 of them to be making 81k or more. Okay? That is stratified sampling. And the benefit is that the distribution of individuals among different categories in your sample is representative, it's quantitatively representative of the actual population. So from that one may expect that the, uh, the sample is representative and will behave in the same way as the actual population. That's the benefit. The drawback is that, well, what if the thing that you're studying isn't actually affected by your strata? It's not affected by your categories, right? Let's say you want to know how people will vote, and you think that their income level will determine how they vote. But what if that's not the case? What if in this particular population, people don't really vote uh, based on what their income level is, but they base their decision on something else? Okay. So that could skew your results, and your, uh, your sample then is actually uh, not very representative of the different uh, categories that, that will determine how people vote, right? Maybe their age affects how they vote more than their income level, and you should have selected your sample based on people's age distribution rather than their income level distribution, okay? Uh, another drawback is sometimes you'll have more than one strata. Maybe you want to look at how whether people are male or female, and what's their age group, and what's their income level. And you want your sample to be representative of all of those categories, right? So you want a sample that is 50% male and 50% female. And in that group of males and females, you have 20% that are 0 to 10 years old, 20% 11 to 20, 20% 21 to 40, and so on. And you also want income level represented in that same sample, right? So in that group of equally populated males and females with 20% from each of these age groups, you also want 15% of them to be making 0 to 30,000. 60% to be making 31,000 to 80,000 and 25% to be making 81,000. First of all, that's difficult to find a sample like that. That takes more effort, right? Maybe you don't have the resources to get a sample like that for your study. The other drawback is let's say your sample size is 100 people. Okay? And you want them all distributed as you want based on income level and age and whether they're male or female. Okay, now how many of those 100 people are going to be, for example, females who are 11 to 20 years old who are making 31 to $80,000, okay? Maybe one person from your group of 100 people, maybe one person will fall in that particular category, but in your entire population of say millions of people in a country, is there only one female who's 11 to 20 years old who's making 31 to $80,000? Probably more than one, okay? But because it is a small category, in your sample size, it's only one person. And so that one person's opinion will affect your study's view of that entire larger category. And that can really skew things as well. So that's the drawback of stratified sampling. There's pros and cons. Now, aside from stratified sampling, there's something called cluster sampling. Okay, so in cluster sampling, rather than separating the population into groups that you expect will behave differently, which is what we did for stratified, 
In cluster sampling, you separate your population into groups that you expect will behave the same. Okay, so using our little circle analogy here, let's say there's this part of the population and this part of the population and this part and this part and you expect all of these sections of the population will behave the same. So what do you do? You pick one of them. You pick one of them and that's your sample. Okay, you expect they'll behave the same so you don't need to sample the other ones. You just pick one of them. Okay, that's the cluster that you sample. That's called cluster sampling. Okay, uh, so for example, let's say there's different cities in a country that you want to study. You just pick one of those cities because you assume that other cities will give you a same response. Maybe you're studying uh, different uh, students uh, in a particular program. Well, you're just going to pick one classroom, right, from that program because you assume that other classrooms are going to give you a similar response. Okay, so that's cluster sampling. Okay, uh, the benefits is that resource wise, you're not doing extra work, right? You don't need to ask the other clusters because you're going to get the same response from the other clusters as from the one that you are asking. Um, also, that one cluster that you have, if it does behave the same as the other clusters, well, then whatever the distribution is among the groups that you might think behave differently based on, say, age, male, female, income level, they're going to be represented in each of those clusters without you having to do the calculations of how many people to ask from which category, right? So that's the benefits of cluster sampling. The drawback is, well, what if your clusters don't behave the same? Okay, what if uh, people from different cities actually will give you a different response? What if students from different classrooms actually will give you a different response, right? So that's the, the drawback of cluster sampling. The one other type of sampling method that we'll discuss is convenience sampling. Okay, so convenience sampling, just like it sounds like, it is studying those individuals that are convenient for you to study. Let's say this is the area of all the individuals in a population and you live right here, right? This is you you're gonna ask the people around you. And that's it, because that's convenient for you, okay? The fact is, every single sampling that you ever do, it has an element of convenience sampling to it, okay? Because, I mean, the fact that you're even taking a sample rather than studying the entire population is because it's more convenient for you to do that, okay? If you're doing cluster sampling, which of those clusters are you gonna pick? likely the one that's more convenient for you to pick, okay? Uh, if you're doing stratified sampling, how are you gonna separate your strata is one thing, but then say you want 50% male respondents, which males are you gonna pick? Probably the ones more convenient for you, okay? But when we actually call something convenience sampling is when convenience is the main sampling method present in how we decide our sample. Not just one of the ones present in the background, but the main one. For example, you're studying um, people's favorite movie genre and you ask your 10 best friends, okay? Because it's convenient for you, okay? You ask your family members because it's convenient for you. When that is the dominant deciding factor, then it's called convenience sampling. Now, of course, the drawback to that is people who are around you are more likely to think like you, so you're biasing things in that particular direction, okay? Um, maybe they don't think like you, but because they are physically accessible to you, they're probably similar in some other way as well, other than just being physically accessible to you. So there is that high risk of bias, but there is a benefit to convenience sampling as well, okay? It's easier to do the study. It's cheaper to do the study. It's quicker to do the study. You can actually get information sooner. And that is valuable, right? Sometimes speed of obtaining information 
can be more important than the quality of information, depending on the circumstances of what you're studying and why and when. So that's the benefit of convenience sampling. And those are the five sampling methods that we discussed. And you know, whatever study you look at, um, they picked some combination of sampling methods, which may have led to some sort of bias. So keep that in mind. Hope you enjoyed that.